Hello everyone. In today's lecture, we will cover how to go about coding backpropagation. The inherent backpropagation algorithm simply uses the chain rule of derivatives to find the gradient. In this lecture, we will learn how to transfer this simplicity to the implementation of backprop. Before we start, let's rewind a few months of our life and go to assignment 3 of our course. In that assignment, you computed the gradients in linear regression problem using AutoGrad. The beauty of AutoGrad was that you pass a function to the grad method of AutoGrad and it returns another function which computes the derivative of the original function. Many of you might have thought, how does AutoGrad work? After this lecture, you will have a good idea on the workings of AutoGrad. We will also cover the basics of how backpropagation is implemented in popular ML frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch. To understand how to implement backprop, we need to understand computational graphs. Computational graphs represent computation using the graph data structure. The nodes of the graph represent operations like additions, multiplications, while the edges represent variables, vectors, tensors. The edges also represent how data flows from one operator to another. As an example, let's construct a computational graph for x into y plus z. We have two operations being performed here, and hence we add a node for multiplication and a node for addition. We are multiplying x and y, so the multiplication node has two incoming edges, one for x and one for y. Similarly, we have two incoming edges for the addition node, one is for z and the other is for the output of x into y. Finally, we have an outgoing edge from the addition node, which gives us our final result. Now, we know how to make a computational graph, so let's try and understand how we can compute the gradient flowing out from a single node in the computational graph. Let's assume that the node performs an operation f, which operates on inputs x and y and outputs z. For each node, you will have a gradient coming in from the outgoing edge of the node. In this figure, dj by dz is the incoming gradient to the node. Here j is our final objective function, which we want to optimize. We also call this gradient the upstream gradient. The question here is how do we distribute this gradient among the input edges of the node? Using the chain rule, we know that dj by dx is equal to dj by dz into dz by dx. Similarly, dj by dy is equal to dj by dz into dz by dy. Now, let's focus on the highlighted term. What do we need to compute these terms? To compute them, we would need to know the derivative function of f. This derivative function might depend on all the inputs and outputs, that is x, y, and z. Hence, if we have values of x, y, and z, we can compute the gradients. The insight here is that all these values which are needed to compute the gradient are local to the node. That is, at a node, you know the value of all the inputs and outputs, and hence can compute the derivative using the data that is stored at the node. Hence, we call them the local gradients. The simple observation here is that the downstream gradient along each input edge is the product of upstream gradient and the local gradient. Let's understand this more clearly using an example. We'll construct the computational graph of function f shown on the slide and then backpropagate to the entire graph. First, we add a multiplication node to multiply w1 and x1, followed by another multiplication node to multiply w2 x2. Then we add an addition node to add the results. Finally, we add an addition node, the output of which will be w0 plus w1x1 plus w2x2. Next, we add a node to multiply the result by minus 1. Then we add a node to perform exponentiation. We add another node to add 1 to the result. And finally, to get the function f, we add a node which performs the inversion operation. Now we have the complete computational graph. Here I have randomly selected values of w's and x as shown on the screen and computed the value of the final result f showing all the intermediate results. Now let's focus on how we backpropagate through this graph. So the gradient n coming into the last node is always 1. The reason being the derivative of any function with respect to itself is 1. Now let's backpropagate through the inversion node. The local derivative of 1 upon x is minus 1 upon x square. And here the value of x is 1.37. And hence our downstream gradient is the upstream gradient, which is 1, multiplied by the local gradient, which is minus 1 upon 1.37 square, which gives us minus 0.53. Now let's backpropagate through the plus 1 node. Here the local gradient is 1, and so the downstream gradient is equal to the upstream gradient. 
Local gradient for the exp node is e to the power x, where x is minus 1. So the downstream gradient is minus 0.53 into e to the power minus 1, which gives minus 0.2. For multiply by minus 1 node, the local gradient is minus 1. Hence, the downstream gradient is minus 0.2 into the local gradient minus 1, which gives 0.2. Coming to the addition node, so the function here is x plus w and df by dx and df by dw are both 1. So the local gradient along each of the input edges is 1 which when multiplied by the upstream gradient of 0.2 gives 0.2 as the downstream gradient. Similarly, we backpropagate through this addition node. Coming to the multiplication node, operation is x into w, so df by dx is w and df by dw is x. So the local gradient along w1 input edge is x1, which is minus 1. Hence, the downstream gradient along w1 is 0.2 into minus 1 is equal to minus 0.2. Similarly, the downstream gradient along the x1 direction is 0.2 into 2, which is the value of w1, which gives 0.4. You might want to note that any expression might have multiple computational graphs, and you can choose any one of those as long as you can compute the local gradients for each of the nodes in your graph. Nodes which are highlighted here can be combined together into a sigmoid node. As you can see, even after combining all of these, we will get the same gradient as well as the result. This works because we know how to compute the local derivative of sigmoid, which is 1 minus sigma x into sigma x. So for sigmoid node, the upstream gradient would be 1 and the local gradient would be 1 minus 0 0.73 into 0 0.73 which again gives us 0.2. Natural question to ask here might be, does this method work for vector valued functions? Answer is yes, this method would still work. For such functions, you will use vector derivatives or Jacobians. How do we implement this? First, we will create a class for present in our computational graph. Next, we need the way to compute the result of the operation and the local gradient at the node. One way to do this is to have two methods. One is a method named forward that computes the result of the operation and saves the inputs and outputs as you might need them later for gradient calculation. Second is a method named backward that computes the local gradient and multiplies it with the upstream gradient. Here is a concrete example. The code here is code for a node which performs the reload operation. Let's go over each of the methods. The first method is for initializing the node. Here it is just storing the type of node and creating a variable to store the inputs. Second, we have a forward method which computes the results. In the first line, I'm just storing the inputs. In the second line, I'm using the np.clip function to clip all the negative numbers to zero. Here, the numbers greater than zero uh, remain as they are. Finally, in the backward method that computes the local gradient, what I'm doing is comparing the input with zero. So if the comparison condition is true, it will return a true Boolean type, which I'm then converting to an integer, which gives me one. If the condition is false, it will return a false Boolean type, which I am converting to integer, which will give me zero. And then finally multiplying it with the upstream gradient and returning the downstream gradient. This is in fact exactly what TensorFlow does. The code on the left shows the code for getting the result and the code on the right is for computing the downstream gradient. For computing the result, TensorFlow uses CY's max function. The function compares each value in the features vector with zero and takes the max of them. Coming to the code for getting the downstream gradient, the gradients variable that is highlighted in red is actually the upstream gradient that is coming into the node. The code portion which is highlighted in blue is the code which computes the local gradient. You can ignore the static cast portion as it is specific to C++, but if you read that code without the static cast, 
We'll understand that it is checking if each value in the features vector is greater than zero. And if the condition is true, we get a one. And if false, we get a zero. Till now we saw code for backpropagating through a single node. The slide here shows the pseudo code for backpropagating through the entire graph. In this pseudo code, we use topological graph sorting. So let me digress a bit and quickly cover what is that. Output of topological sort is ordering of nodes of graph such that for each edge UV, that is an edge that goes from node U to node V, it appears that the edge is going from left to right, that is the node U appears before node V in the ordering. A simple example is as shown in the figure. The graph on the left and right are the same graphs. However, one on the left is unsorted, while the one on right is topologically sorted. As you can see in the sorted graph, every edge goes from left to right. So to get the final result, uh, the forward function here basically shows that we sort the graph topologically and then call the forward method for each node as per the returned ordering. For backpropagation, that is the backward function here, we take the reverse topological ordering and call backward method of each node as per the returned ordering. Now let's look at some actual code. Here I will run you through the code for the example that we saw previously in the slides. You can see the figure in the picture that I have opened up here. So first we have a class called var. So this is just a class for a container variable. It does nothing much but just stores the value of the variable. It is useful because for the other classes that we have, the inputs to those classes will be in form of the variable class. So moving on to the second class that is the add class, the inputs are a and b. So a and b are of type var, that is the first class that we saw. So in the class add, I'm just adding the values of a and b. And then as we know for an addition operation, the local derivatives are one. So in the list of self.grad, I am storing two tuples. So a comma one represents that pass the local derivative one along the input edge of a and b comma one would represent that pass the local derivative one along the input edge b. Now for the mul class, again, I'm just multiplying a dot value and b dot value. And for computing the gradient, what I'm doing is passing the value of B, that is B dot value in the input edge direction of A. Similarly, I'm passing A dot value along the direction of the input edge B. Similarly, I have different classes, one for inversion and one for exponentiation. The get gradients uh, method that you see here, it basically takes in the last node that you have and puts it into a stack. Then it multiplies the local and the upstream gradient to get the downstream gradient. And it checks if this node has any child nodes. If yes, it would again put them in the stack. And this way, uh, this function would go on computing the local and the upstream gradient of the entire computation graph. It's fine if you don't understand this get gradients function now as this would in no way hamper your understanding of concepts. As you can see here, I have coded in uh, the example that is shown in the figure and I have just finally run it through the get gradients function. So I get all the gradients and then I'm just printing in all the derivatives of each of these variables. So let us just run this code. Yeah. So as you can see, the derivative of the result with respect to W0 is 0.2, which is exactly what we get when uh, we solved it theoretically. Similarly, we have the exact same numbers of minus 0.2 and 0.4 for W1 and X1. So as you could see here, the code for implementing this is really simple. You have all these very small classes, which just have two lines in them. And 
even with this, you are able to just backpropagate through the entire computation graph. So now let us try and understand and look at code of how we can actually implement a neural network using this. So here is a code for a toy neural network library that I implemented. I named the library NNlib. So it uses the technique that we saw previously in the slides for implementing backpropagation. So let me just walk you through the entire code. So here I'm using this toy library to train a very small neural network. The specification is as shown here. So here FCN5 represents a fully connected layer with five nodes. So my neural network is just a fully connected layer followed by a ReLU layer, again followed by a fully connected layer, again followed by a ReLU layer. And finally, it has a fully connected layer with just one node. So the last function I'm using here is MSE. So this line just initializes my neural network as per the specification and returns the NN object, which is a neural network object. The code here is just for reading the data into appropriate areas. So the interesting code is this uh, training loop. So the first line, the output equal to NN.infer. Uh, what I'm doing is passing in just one example from the data set and doing a forward pass over my neural network and storing the result in the output. Then I'm using that output to compute the loss that I'm facing. Finally, for backpropagating, I'm just typing nn.backprop and the library takes care of the entire backpropagation that happens through the neural network. And I'm finally updating my weights and biases using nn.step function. So let us dive into what each of these methods have in them. So here is the neural network class, which we were using in the previous file. So as you can see in the initialization, what I'm doing is I'm just defining my loss to be MSE as that is what was specified in the specification. For maintaining the layers, I have a layer list. And so I just read the specification. And if I see that the specification has FCN, then I add a fully connected layer. If it has a ReLU, I add a ReLU layer. For forward propagating or the forward pass of the neural network, what I do is just iterate over the layer list and I call the forward method of each of the layers. So each of the layer here is again an object and that's why it has a forward and a backward methods which we saw previously in the slides. For backpropagation again, I have an upstream grad of one. I just uh, call the backward method for the last node and then I just again iterate over the layer list and call the backward method for each of the nodes. Finally, for the step, I just again iterate over the layer list and if the layer type is a fully connected layer, then I update my uh, weights and biases using the layer.step method. So as you can see from this code, the gist of the entire library uh, lies in this dot forward and dot backward methods that each layer or loss function has. So let's just quickly go over them. So let me open the layers folder where I have basically two files. One is for implementing the ReLU layer. So this code is exactly the code that we saw in the slides previously. There is no change in it. So now let me move towards the fully connected node. So here what I'm doing is initializing the fully connected layer using the init method. So I'm just randomly initializing all my weights and biases and coming to the forward method, I'm just multiplying the weights and inputs that is np dot dot self dot weights into inputs and then adding the biases that is self dot bias. For back propagating, so I have theoretically derived what the local gradient would look like and I've multiplied it with the upstream gradient. So it is okay if you don't uh, understand what this local gradient is but you get the concept that downstream gradient is upstream gradient into the local gradient. It would actually be a very good exercise if you could the theoretically derive this local gradient and code this up. Finally, in the step method, what I'm doing is updating my weights and biases. And here the LR is just the learning rate that I'm using.
So I have a similar folder where I have all my losses. So here is the class for the MSC loss. So here again, the forward uh, pass would just be prediction minus ground truth squared. And the backward pass is two into the self dot input into the upstream gradient that is there. So as you can see here, again, most of the library is just built in this classes that I showed you. So the advantage of this is that if you want to, let's say, add a new loss, or if you want to add a new layer, then you can directly just create a new class and put it at the appropriate uh, location in the library and it would still work. So if I want to add a convolutional layer, then I will just have to make a new class, call it con, uh, define the forward, backward and step methods and I'm done and I can just start using convolution in my neural network. So when I run this, uh, I just plotted the loss versus epoch number graph. So as you can see, the more I train, the lower my loss becomes. So this is just a kind of like a proof that this code works and it's working fine. So it would actually be a good idea if anyone just wants to try this and implement their own uh, toy neural network library. It is not much of an effort and you will be easily able to implement it. So now let us go back to our slides. Yeah, so the method we saw for backpropagation is just a very small part of what is a very large field of automatic differentiation. So the technique we saw is called reverse mode differentiation. If you want to know more about automatic differentiation and how it is used in machine learning, I would highly recommend reading this survey paper. And on this note, let's end this lecture. Thank you.